The title of today's show is New PGTA Test Shows That Nearly All Blastocysts and Fetal Tissue Are Mosaic. And I'm so glad that we have genetic counselor Megan Doyle on today. Did you know that nearly all embryos show some level of mosaicism, even in successful pregnancies? In this interview, we will dive into the latest findings on PGTA testing and what they mean for embryo selection and fertility treatment. Join us as we explore how these advancements could reshape decision-making for patients and providers alike. Welcome to the Egg Whisper Show. I'm so delighted to have Megan Doyle back on today. Welcome, Megan. Thank you for having me back, Amy. Megan is a licensed, certified genetic counselor specializing in fertility genetics and the founder of DNA Genetic Counseling. With a passion for empowering fertility patients, she provides clear, evidence-based guidance to help them navigate complex topics like mosaicism and PGTA testing. Megan began her career in 2018 as an in-house genetic counselor where her expertise quickly became essential for interpreting evolving genetic testing results. Today, through DNA and her educational outreach, she bridges gaps in fertility care, ensuring patients and providers alike are informed and supported in making the best decisions for family building. The article highlights that nearly all blastocysts and fetal tissue are mosaic to some extent. Megan, before we get into what this means for fertility patients, can you explain the PGTA test and what it does? Absolutely. So when we do PGTA in the clinic, we're taking usually between five to 10 cells from the area of the embryo that's usually going to become the placenta. The purpose of PGTA is to look at the chromosomes. And usually doctors are using the results from PGTA to help patients prioritize their embryos for transfer. So if the results are normal, those embryos are usually transferred first. And embryos with not normal results usually get transferred not first. Not only not first, but sometimes not at all. And that's what you do for me is you save embryos. You're real, you're literally like an embryo rescuer. You know, you are rescuing embryos that people would not have prioritized. And then once you talk to them, they learn more about their results. And then they can have babies from these embryos that are being described as abnormal when they're really normal because PGTA isn't perfect. What makes the test more sensitive? So usually when we're doing PGTA, we're testing all of those five to 10 cells in one big cluster. So this sensitive test that they did in this research study was testing cells one by one and getting the genetic information from each, which isn't something that we're able to do in the clinic. And what is mosaicism? Mosaicism is when some of those cells have different genetic results from others. So usually when we get a mosaic result from PGTA, It would mean that some of the cells are expected to have normal chromosomes, but some of the cells are expected to have abnormal chromosomes. And why can a mosaic embryo result in a healthy baby? How does that happen? The truth is we don't really know, but we do know that it can happen. And for a lot of patients, it does. And that's why I think for you and I, it is really heartbreaking a lot of the time when patients don't get that opportunity. It's possible that we only tested a small amount of cells. And so the part of the embryo that's going to become the baby wasn't tested when they did the test. So maybe all of those cells had completely normal chromosomes inside of them, and that might be why that completely healthy babies are born. Yeah, and we never test the part that becomes the baby because that's the inner cell mass that's inside the embryo. And what we test is the trophectoderm cells. So those are the cells on the outer shell. Why are the findings in this new study so interesting? I mean, when I saw this study, I said, Megan, we have to talk about this. People need to know about it. So why is it such a fascinating and interesting study? I think it's really interesting because they saw that every embryo they looked at had mosaicism. But when we do genetic testing in the clinic, we don't see mosaic results very often. And so it is quite different from what we usually see. It's hard for patients when they do PGTA. We're hoping for normal results. That's what gets bolded on their report. That is what everyone is hoping for in their heart. And so when they get a mosaic result, It's not what they want. It's not what they want to hear. They don't want to see anything that says anything other than normal. And it could take a really long time to come around to the idea of transferring an embryo that has a mosaic result. And so I think the idea that maybe mosaicism is a bit more common than we thought, maybe every embryo might have this type of finding, might help patients feel a little bit more comfortable with using embryos that have this type of result. 
Yeah. So when I see a mosaic embryo, I tell my patients that's normal. It's not an abnormal finding. And I prioritize mosaic embryos just like I would a nor an embryo that comes back in bold saying euploid, which means a normal set of chromosomes. So how should patients interpret mosaic results when they see something like that? I think that there are still a lot of different factors that can go into interpreting a mosaic result. Sometimes we use level of mosaicism, low or high, is it closer to normal or closer to aneuploid or abnormal. We also can look at, was it just a piece of a chromosome that was abnormal, segmental, or a full copy? All of these different things, including how the embryo looked under the microscope, its grading or morphology, how quickly it became a blastocyst, there are so many things that can help a patient prioritize embryos for transfer. And meeting with a genetic counselor like me can help them decide what they're comfortable with and how they want to prioritize those embryos. Some embryos with mosaic results might do equally well to embryos that test normal, but others might have a lower chance of bringing home a baby, possibly higher miscarriage rates. And every patient feels different about those types of things, so it's important to think about them in detail. And I think what you just mentioned is really important because sometimes patients sign discard forms even before they get their reports back. So they've already signed a consent form that says, I want my abnormal embryos discarded. And what they also don't know is sometimes they're signing that they want mosaicism masked. So it's really important, really important that you get your official report unmasked and that you meet with someone like Megan to talk about your report so that you're not discarding potentially normal embryos, especially for my patients over 40. You and I, I would say more you than me, because you are responsible for counseling my patients, have saved so many embryos from the discard box, so to speak. So thank you for all the work. I can't say thank you enough. So what are the potential risks? You already mentioned maybe a higher risk of miscarriage and potential outcomes of transferring a mosaic compared to a euploid. What should patients know? I think a lot of the time people are thinking mostly about the health of a child that's going to be born from an embryo with a mosaic result. And there are nuances, depending on the specific chromosome sometime, that people need to be aware of. But the more data we gather, it seems like today and the end of 2024, generally the risk of having a child with a genetic condition related to the mosaic result is about 1% or less. And I think a lot of the times people think that number is going to be a lot higher. Any pregnancy, regardless of whether that embryo tests euploid or not, whether you get pregnant without assistance, there's going to be a risk of a genetic condition or a birth defect, and it doesn't really seem like those risks are all the, are higher when we use a mosaic result. So again, you can get information tailored to your result to make sure that you're comfortable, but I think that it's important for people to know, especially with the findings from this study, that it doesn't seem like the risks from babies born from mosaics are increased when you use a mosaic compared to a euploid. What would you say to a patient who is starting their IVF journey who, let's say, doesn't have options for which clinic that they're going to work with because of where they live, and the doctor won't prioritize a mosaic embryo? How can they be their best advocate? So that's something that I help patients with a lot, and some doctors are convinced when they hear the research. So that's something that I help them with when I put their consult notes together is I fill it with lots of data from the research so that I can help them be an advocate and show them that for their specific embryo, there may not be that specific risk. And some clinics are willing to change their mind when they hear that information and it might take time. But many of my patients have been the first at their clinic to transfer an embryo with a mosaic result. And if it goes well, then they're usually more willing to do that type of thing. But we also have the option of moving to a different clinic if that is something that they feel like they have the means to do. Depending there. Yeah. I mean, I know that for myself, when I get your consult note and you reassure me, then I feel more reassured and confident about transferring the embryos that we're going to transfer. As a genetic counselor, does this study change or reinforce the current recommendations for fertility patients undergoing PGTA? Does this change anything as far as how you counsel patients or... Are you basically sharing the same recommendations as before? My recommendations are the same, to be honest. I think that what matters to me is seeing what happens when we use embryos. Because right now, when we're doing testing on embryos, we are still testing five to 10 cells. We're not testing them one at a time. And all the different PGT labs do things so differently that what really matters is 
what happens when we use embryos with these results? What do they implant? Do they miscarry? How healthy are the babies? And that's what we have years of data on. So I'm not sure that one study at this point is necessarily going to change all of our recommendations. And so that's why it's important to look at the broader data that we have. And that is becoming more and more reassuring for a lot of people the longer that we think. When patients go to a fertility clinic, they're not usually given an option or a choice as far as which PGT company the clinic is going to use. As a patient, are there any questions that a patient could ask so that they're more informed about what the limitations could be before they start an IVF cycle with that particular company? So you can ask things like if, if mosaicism will be reported back to you or not, if you feel like that's information that you want. And if not, you can ask how mosaic results are categorized. So sometimes embryos of mosaic results are, again, split into high and low. Low-level mosaics typically do better than high-level mosaics. And so sometimes those are called euploid or normal, but sometimes those are called aneuploid or abnormal. And so an embryo that has a really good chance of leading to a healthy baby when mosaic results are masked is put into an abnormal category, and you might be losing an embryo with a great chance of success. And so sometimes these nuances can play a role in whether a patient chooses to do PGTA or not because it, it could really impact the number of embryos they have available for transfer based on lab reporting and clinic policies. And I'm glad you brought that up because it can influence whether someone wants to do PGTA testing or not, because I counsel patients from all over the world. And I feel like if you're working with a clinic and you have, don't have any options and they won't allow you to transfer low mosaic segmentals, then you might be better off not doing PGTA at all if you're not going to be able to use every single embryo you possibly have. I wish that patients would have more autonomy over what they could transfer. And if a patient's well-informed, has informed consent, they should be able to transfer any embryo that they would like to transfer. Are there specific scenarios where the information from this study might be particularly more relevant than other scenarios? I think that this is mostly relevant for thinking about low-level mosaic results. So those are really the ones where we're expecting less of the cells tested to have had genetic differences. and where we do see the better outcomes. And so this is really where I think this is relevant if we're thinking from this study, all embryos showed mosaic finding. Maybe that makes sense. Maybe these are the ones that fit with that and why the outcomes are so good for embryos like that. If all embryos do have this, maybe that's why we are seeing that these do so well because it isn't really that unique. Yeah. And do you think the lab environment might have had something to do with these results? I think that there is a lot that we need to take into account with this study. It is possible that some of these could be false positives when we're testing a single cell. I talked to some of my colleagues who know a lot more about the lab side of things than I do, and there is sometimes concern for a higher rate of false positives when we're testing cell by cell. That's why we don't do it in the clinic at this point in time. So we certainly need to take these results with a grain of salt. They tested the whole embryo, which really means doing things to embryos that we wouldn't be doing in the clinic itself. And so it's hard to know exactly how this would correlate with an actual embryo that somebody might use. So it is important to keep in mind those limitations. Is there anything else that we should keep in mind when looking at the study and its finding? I'd like to see it repeated as well. Just other people doing this type of research and seeing if we see the same things or not. I think that that's important to do with, with all research and see how things evolve. Yeah, to make sure that it's reproducible. That makes sense. So, Megan, where can people find you? I mean, if it were up to me, every single patient going through IVF, and I know that's a lot of people in this country and in Canada and all over the world for you to work with, but how can they work with you if they're looking for a specialized genetic counselor in fertility genetics? You can go to my website, dnaid.com, D-N-A-I-D-E.com. I have my online calendar there. You can pick a time that works for you and meet with me through Zoom. And you can also find me on Instagram at DNAGC. I post lots of information there about research studies like this and other information about PGT and other infertility genetic information and our collaborations as well. Awesome. Megan, is there anything else you'd like to add today? I think just keep in mind that abnormal is not a genetic result. And so like you said, that could mean anything. If you know your embryos are abnormal on PGTA, 
ask more questions, get more information. They're your embryos. You deserve that much before you make these crucial decisions. Excellent point. Well, thank you, Megan, again for joining us. Thank you for all the work that you're doing in this field. You're saving embryos one pregnancy at a time. Thanks for having me again.